May knowledge remove ignorance as the light dispel the darkness. The history of science is a history of our collective learning. Sir Isaac Newton once famously said, if I have seen further, it is by standing on the shoulders of giants. So honoring the words of this great mathematician, the theme of this year's conference is fostering research through collaboration and innovation. So keeping that in mind, ladies and gentlemen, we are very proud to present to you our conference proceedings book. So we hope you enjoy this short clip, which highlights our conference proceedings book. You can download our conference proceedings book by going to our website. Now, ladies and gentlemen, to formally commence the proceedings, I cordially invite the conference chair, Dr. Nadika Tisera, to deliver the inaugural address. Thank you, Gayanti. Uh, Director ITUM, Professor A.P. De Silva, keynote speaker of IRC ITUM 2022. Dear colleagues, students, ladies and gentlemen, I warmly welcome you all to our first international conference of Institute of Technology, University of Moritua. My sincere congratulations to all researchers who will be presenting their work at this conference. As in previous research symposium of ITUM, IRC ITUM 2022 will become an excellent forum for sharing knowledge and will generate a discussion on a variety of topics representing latest technological developments and future trends in many industries. Today, we have more than 30 experts representing different technology and engineering related disciplines from local and international universities who are coming together at this conference. This will allow us to broaden our horizon by developing important networks and engaging in fruitful collaboration. From physics to material science, or reading the lines between science and entrepreneurship, we are presenting to you today a world-renowned individual who has achieved his target as a scientist and as a successful founder and co-founder of some spin-off. Through our keynote speech, we are presenting you today, Professor A.P. De Silva. He will share with you some happy stories originated from our motherland, Sri Lanka. My sincere gratitude to Director of ITUM, Major General S.K. Tirunam Karusu for giving leadership and support to make this conference a reality. On behalf of the organizing committee, I'm very much thankful to the head of the research unit, Dr. Mrs. Srimala Pereira, the heads of division of ITUM, and all the academics and non-academic staff of ITUM for their unstinting support extend for this event. I'm extremely happy that you have joined with us to experience a very pleasant, interesting, and a fruitful conference. Thank you all. Thank you, Madam. Now it is my privilege to invite the head of the Institute, Major General, retired, SK Tirunavu Karasu, RSP, VSV, USP, the director of ITUM, to welcome our distinguished audience. The keynote speaker, uh, Professor APD Silva of the School of Chemistry and Chemical Engineering, Queen's University, United Kingdom, the head of the research unit of Institute of Technology, University of Moratua, Dr. Mrs. 
Sri Mala Perra, the chairperson of the conference, Dr. Nadika Tisera, academics, distinguished invitees, students, ladies and gentlemen, good morning. It is indeed an immense pleasure to send my greetings and best wishes to the first International Research Conference of Institute of Technology, University of Moratua, on the theme of fostering research through collaboration and innovation. <clears throat> I am both delighted and honored to be a part of this congregation of scholars and researchers as we launch the first ever International Research Symposium at uh, Institute of Technology, University of Moratua. Ladies and gentlemen, as many of you are aware, the research culture of ITUM is quite established and strong as the ITUM has been carrying out its research projects over the years in collaboration with the uh, University of Moratua since its inception. Ladies and gentlemen, as the director of uh, Institute of Technology, University of Moratua, First and foremost, uh, let me warmly welcome Professor A.P.D. Silva, the chief guest as well as the keynote speaker of the conference who's, who has joined to share his expertise with us today. I extend my gratitude to Professor A.P.D. Silva for gracing the occasion amidst of your busy schedule. Also, ladies and gentlemen, let me congratulate the ITM Research Unit headed by Dr. Sri Mala Perra for their untiring efforts in making this event a success. I am impressed that this year the Research Unit has been able to extend its uh, research forum to an international level by bringing together over 30 eminent scholars and other scholars from wide spectrum of engineering fields from Sri Lanka and overseas. <clears throat> I'm quite glad to see that the conference theme and the sub-themes have been selected covering contemporary issues and emerging challenges in the industry and the society in which we operate and serve. Thus, this conference will uh, serve as a platform for both new and seasoned uh, scholars to get to know each other. I believe that this congregation will pave the way for each and every one of you to learn from each other, to make an impact on society and to further the visions of our institu institutions. As the conference uh, proceeding includes an array of interesting research papers by scholars from diverse backgrounds and disciplines, this will indeed be a, a, a very memorable experience for young researchers and academics. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, let me once again extend my heartiest congratulations and gratitude to Dr. Srimala Perra and her team for their tremendous effort and contribution towards the success of this event. I am truly grateful for the time, energy, thought that they have invested in organizing this program. Finally, I take this opportunity to thank all those who have contributed in numerous ways to make this event a success. Ladies and gentlemen, I thank you all. Thank you, sir. Ladies and gentlemen, now we are at the cusp of the most anticipated event in the agenda, the keynote speech. To formally introduce our keynote speaker, I invite Dr. Ruchira Vijay Sena, Senior Lecturer attached to the Division of Textile and Clothing Technology.
um hello uh, good morning uh, dear ladies and gentlemen uh, and also people who are connecting from uh, various other countries good day to you i think today i have the honor of introducing a very influential personality uh, i mean is very influential not only to me but also for large number of people in sri lanka uh, and it's it's one of the best things that i can do today uh, as a participant of this international conference uh, our keynote speaker professor ap de silva uh, i would like to invite him uh, to uh, perform uh, to do his uh, uh, you know keynote speech uh, professor ap is one of the most renowned character in scientific research particularly due to his pioneering work in development of molecular logic gates and uh, his influential work includes the invention of molecular logic gates and the construction of fluorescent sensory systems and today he is going to talk about these uh, systems in detail i'm pretty sure that he will also uh, include some of his inspirations uh, as a, uh, um, a sri lankan born scientist and his journey throughout uh, his work uh, in developing these type of systems he was a postdoctoral researcher at queens university belfast lecturer university of colombo um, and also uh, queens university belfast uh, for many number of years uh, he is also a professor at Qu uh, queens university belfast and also elected member of uh, royal irish academy and above all he is very influential uh in the way he conduct research and i think there are so many things that we can learn from him and one of those of course is how to be a humble person with all these achievements in his belt he still uh, has this quality of being a very humble person and we always look up to him and i think in my life one of the best opportunities that i have uh, is to have the uh, the opportunity to work and have the inspiration from a personality like professor afid silva sir uh, uh it's my i would like to formally welcome you for this uh, keynote speech i think it's going to be great but uh, uh, i am pretty sure uh, that you would uh, really help us uh, in enlightening some, on some of these concepts thank you very much shall i start then sir so, yes sir we can hear you sir okay uh, thank you very much thank you very much uh, it is a great honor to join you all at your first international research symposium i i did not know that it, i didn't realize that it was the first one thank you very much and thank you especially to mr tirunal karasu the director himself for taking part with us on this occasion and i am very grateful to ruchira vijayasena and nadika tisera both people for thinking of me to join them on this occasion and as several of them mentioned that i i am very very grateful for the chance to share some of the stories of little bits of science that happened to me uh, of course i am a very old guy now so it is it means that there's quite a long experience Recording of science recording in progress so i'm very grateful that i've had all these chances uh, to share in little bits of science and uh, and it, as ruchira pointed out uh, many of these little stories that i want to tell you started out in sri lanka and of course i still think very much of sri lanka and 
and how it has enabled science in all its versions. So the stories I want to tell today under the title that is up on this slide here, I am a chemist, that is my training. And as we all know, uh, like all of us who are joining today in this research symposium, chemistry is one of those central sciences. And it is called a central science because uh, we can extend from chemistry in one direction towards medicine and biology. And in the opposite direction, we can go towards physics, mathematics, computer science. And as many of us will know from our school days, when we are studying for GCE advanced level or equivalent before we come to university, we have to study chemistry as a subject, whether we want to go to become a medical doctor or whether we want to become an electronic engineer. Either one has to do chemistry as a foundation. So I consider myself very fortunate to have been able to have spent most of my life uh, professionally, at least in chemistry. So I want to show that even in one person's lifetime, we can actually go from this central science towards medicine and on the opposite direction towards uh, computer science. Of course, it is not to say that I am able to understand medicine or that I'm able to understand computer science in any serious kind of way. I have trouble enough understanding chemistry, but the message I want to give the youngest people here is that here is me, an old guy with a white beard and no hair on his head. If these things can happen to me in a Sri Lankan context, and I'll mention some of that context as Ruchira mentioned as we go along, then I hope many of you will think here you are at the beginning of your professional life, you are a young person, you have the advantage of youth and you have the advantage of talent. That's why they have taken you into the Institute of Technology at the University of Morotua. Then what more can you achieve now with all the technology skills that you have? So please do remember that as I tell you these stories. These stories happen to me and bigger stories can happen to you with your talent and the future that's in front of you. Okay, and then given that basis, I will tell these little stories that I have. So now I work in this, uh, not in this building, this is the building where our own Mr. Thirunava Karasu lives. Uh, chemists are not welcome in there because we would work in hard labs and things. Uh, and of course, I have retired from the university just a couple of months ago, but I'm still connected with the university. So it is my <clears throat> great pleasure to be associated with this university that has given me a scientific life. I'm really grateful to Queens for that. But I'm also grateful to Sri Lanka and uh, the university that I went to, the university I went to is in the University of Colombo here. Uh, and University of Colombo, uh, I, I hope you regard it as a brother institution or a sister institution rather than as a competing institution. And I show in this picture uh, two scientific papers. As you know, when a scientist makes a discovery, then we try to collect all the information and write a document. And that document is a scientific paper. And then this document is sent to some publishing organization so that it can be checked for accuracy. And that is peer review. Other professional scientists will read it and find out whether they believe the ideas that are inside and whether the ideas inside are supported by experimental evidence. And one of these publishing houses is the Chemical Society. The Chemical Society is an organization in the UK, which has existed for, I think, over 200 years. And they are the Society of Chemists. 
there are other societies now, but this is one of the oldest societies of chemistry in the world. And they run a journal. That's the J in the front. So it's a diary or the daily occurrences, proceedings that happen in this society in the UK. And so people from all around the world will send their science discoveries to these people and then they will check it. And if they agree that the check is okay, then they will publish it to remain in the world for as long as time exists. And, and I'm showing you this one from 1985 before ba your baby, your parents were born. So it's a long, long time ago. And I want to remind you also that 1985 was a time of much lower technology than you have now. And it also was a time of great sadness. And I, I remember that sadness and I shared in that sadness with friends. And it was a time when Sri Lanka was in deep, deep trouble. Many people had died and many people were living in the fear of death. And so that was an extremely difficult time in Sri Lanka. And I want to show you that this is a little bit of science done with Daya Rupasita and myself from the chemistry department at the University of Colombo and post office box 1490. It's still the same number. And in Colombo, Colombo 3, as you can see here, in Sri Lanka, the, the title of the paper and some of the detail, the abstract of the paper, maybe don't really matter at this moment. But it is to show you that here is an international publication of some reputation, definitely at that time, which checked and took this little bit of science that we were able to do, which started under a family tree in Mount Lavinia. It's so hard. So I, I am very, very happy and proud to present this. And I hope you share in that happiness and the pride. And so this is especially for Rujira Nadika and Mr. Tirunau Karasu and all the people who are listening in. And so that was in 1985. And in the following year, we were able to send another little piece, this time with Salia de Silva helping greatly. And then we were able to gradually build a story of some significance to the world, to the world for scientists in general. Because as you know, one of the jobs of a scientist is to make new discoveries and then to try and help the thinking of other scientists. Of course, we must not stop there. Just like we were kindly told at the start about standing on the shoulders of giants. And so we stand on what has gone before us and then we make discoveries by using those as the foundation. And then we give that message to the world for other scientists to take and build further. And so I was very, very grateful that I was able to be part of this chain of events of standing on the shoulders of another person. And then somebody stands on my shoulders and they go on and I'm no giant. But finally, what happens is we continue this chain of scientific development. And that's the meaning of the word Vidya in Singhala and Tamil. And so I wanted to show you these two papers right at the start, just to say that in a time of great distress in Sri Lanka, and at a time where I myself was going through various personal battles, I was looking after my grandmother as a principal carer at the time, very happy. And therefore, you can understand that science was not the most important thing in my life, for sure. And still, we can be sometimes in receipt of gifts, if you would say. And in, with those, we can make science progress. And as I will show you, the progress of this has helped thousands of people. And I will try and show you that as we go along. Huh? So the first thing is that to note is that scientific discoveries can happen under very difficult circumstances in time and in place. And as we know, Sri Lanka is a great but small country with resources being limited in various ways. And still, and still, we can make achievements of this kind. That is the first thing I want to tell you. And now I want to summarize for you 
the story of that discovery that started off in those two little scientific papers I showed you. But I want to share that story with you, not at the level of a chemist. I want to share that in, at the level of a person generally interested in knowledge. As a human being who is interested in learning, I, I realize that Many of you joining us today, I'm again grateful that you joined us. And I realize that you will have various backgrounds and various interests. And maybe chemistry is not an interest of yours, even though you did have to do it in school. So I will try to keep my stories as general as possible and as human as possible. Huh? So what started off in Sri Lanka at the time was what is now known as the PET design or more generally known as the fluorescent pet design. It's a, it's a tool, it's a design tool that can be used by various scientists for various purposes. And I'll show you some of the things that it can be used for. And this design starts in the following way. It looks at a green leaf, a green leaf that Sri Lanka is so blessed with. And Ireland here is very blessed with also. And as we know from the, our school days, a green leaf performs photosynthesis every time you see it as green. Why? Because sunlight is falling on it and only green light escapes. The blue light and the red light is absorbed inside the leaf. And by absorbing it, it gains energy for the special molecules in the leaf. And those special molecules in the leaf then undergo what is known as a photo-induced electron transfer. Photo-induced means what? It means light will start something. Photo-induced means it's only when light falls on those molecules that something will happen. And what is the something? Electron transfer, the ET. And electron transfer means to take an electron, one of the smallest things in the simple universe, you would say. There are smaller elementary particles now, of course, but the electron is certainly the smallest elementary particle that we meet in school. Particle physics people will know smaller particles, of course, but electrons are some of the smallest things that we know. However, if you like to think about chemistry for a moment, chemistry's small things are atoms and molecules which are made from them. Uh, atoms joined to one another into some kind of pattern, like a necklace, will be then become a ring-shaped molecule. Why are molecules important? Because it's molecules when you combine them in huge numbers that you get biological cells. And when you combine biological cells, then you will get organs of different kinds. And when you put those organs together in the right organization, then you will get living things. So living things start off with the fundamental unit of molecules and atoms. That's why they are important, not because they are part of chemistry, but because they are part of us. No molecules, no atoms, no us. No conference today. So this is a very, very important thing that the value of being human, the value of being alive is strongly connected with chemistry because it's the molecules that make us live. And within the molecules, there will be electrons. So that's why we can imagine how the electrons are the some of the smallest things that we encounter. Just because something is small, just because something is invisible, it does not mean that it cannot have an influence on us. Sorry, I used a lot of negatives, but I wanted to stress this fact that it's not only big things that influence us. It is not only visible things that influence us. No, no. Even in oldest of cultures, one of which is Sri Lanka, we encounter stories about ghosts. What are ghosts? 
ghosts are invisible things which move people which make people scared of their lives so in a similar kind of way i want to present some nice ghosts which are molecules and atoms and electrons and it's a good thing that these are nice ghosts because they live inside you and they live inside me and these molecules that are inside me in their huge huge numbers is the reason that i live and breathe and think and do a little bit of chemistry so it's the same for us all huh? so now i want to show you what electrons can do inside molecules for our little purpose here is a little picture here that i have shown you which has three boxes one is a green box with a hole in it and it's called a receptor what is a receptor a receptor is something that receives something else that is all it is a of course we are thinking about molecules it's a molecule which can catch other molecules or atoms so these are very common in living things every time we think anything which means basically when we are alive and any time we do anything like lift a finger open an eye receptors are very busy inside you and inside me my receptors will be very slow now because i'm a old guy but yours will be very fast and what it means is it will do its job when it meets the correct target it will receive it so for example when you think anything when you think a thought there are sodium ions in a plus moving along the nerve there is potassium as well but just think of that sodium plus moving along the nerve what it will then do is it will be caught in one place and released then it will move a little further and be caught again then it will be released again so this catching and releasing is done by these receptors in other words these green boxes can be found in biology in large numbers or in biochemistry or in physiology so that then you can locate the receptor that you want from these places but the biological receptors tend to be quite complicated so we can use simpler receptors which are available in chemistry especially subjects like inorganic chemistry because sodium ion say na plus like in this picture here for example showing you a m plus in general so we study sodium plus in inorganic chemistry so we can find it there for example so when i was in the university of colombo professor rama krishna who was originally from batiklo he taught us inorganic chemistry and that is one place where i met the first receptor and similarly i need for our little story something called a fluorophore what is a fluorophore this word p h o r e is used very commonly in parts of science to say the origin of something so there are various like pharmacophore is the origin of pharmaceutical action so in the same way what is a fluorophore it is the origin of fluorescence action what is fluorescence action there are fluorescent lights like in some houses you will have a fluorescent light or the commonest example of fluorescence i can give you is people who work on the road either to repair the road or people who help to remove the waste from our house they will come to our house in their lorry or tractor and they will usually be wearing orange shirts they perform a job as essential as the job that each one of us does they perform a job as vital as any job that we do and i want to take their example where they are wearing this orange shirt why do they wear that orange shirt it is so that they will be visible to traffic on the road so that they will not accidentally be hit by a bus or a car or a bicycle so in order for them to do their job safely they wear this orange shirt so that sunlight falls on their shirt and gives out strong orange light so it's a strong signal to say i am here 
please don't hit me. That idea. So the dye molecules that are in that orange shirt are similar to the molecules that we use here as a fluorophore. So notice I am not drawing atoms in particular. I'm not showing you the pattern of atoms yet. I am just showing you a philosophy, a way of thinking. So we have our fluorophore. What will it be able to do? It will be able to pick up light photons like this violet arrow I'm showing you. And then it can give out light like this orange arrow I'm showing you here, which I will discuss in a moment. So we take this fluorophore, which is available through physical chemistry usually. Uh, Professor Pereira, who lived in Bambalavitya, she was the person who introduced me to fluorophores at the University of Colombo. So we go to one part of chemistry, or we can pick it up in molecular physics now. We can go to one part of science and find a fluorophore. We can go to another part of science, like biology or inorganic chemistry, and we can pick up a receptor. Notice we go to different places to pick up different things. This is the basic idea of trade, trade in general. For example, like a very famous case of like Marco Polo, he started off in Venice in Italy, and then he goes to Hangzhou in China, which is very, very far away at the time he was traveling overland on the Silk Road. Why? Because he could take things valuable in Venice but which are, which are cheap in Venice, sorry, and take them to China where they're extremely valuable. And then he could take things, he could buy things which are very cheap in China and bring them back to Venice where they are very expensive. That is the idea of trade. In the same way, in science, in science discovery, it is important to go to some place and pick up what is available there and bring it to a new place. So that is why we get the fluorophore from one part of science and we get the receptor from another part of science. And we bring them to organic chemistry, which is the place where we can build organic molecules. So we take a fluorophore, which is a molecule, and we take a receptor, which is another molecule, and then we join them together in this way. But notice the way they are joined. The green box is not touching the gray box they are slightly separated by this red box. And the red box is called a spacer. It is called a spacer because it puts a little space, like a space bar we hit in a sentence to separate words, we separate them. But like these two words here are part of the same sentence. And these two boxes are part of the same system. This is a very common engineering design which the University of Morotua and the University of Peradenia will be very famous for. Modules or components is a basic idea of engineering. You combine these modules, you can plug and play them now in computer science, for example. And the, what is the advantage of having modules? Modules preserve a large amount of their properties before and after connecting into the system. So that's very important because then the modules have predictive behavior. Chemistry doesn't have a lot of predictive behavior. Life based on chemistry does not have a lot of predictive behavior. But here is a part of, chem of chemistry, a small part of chemistry, which is now going to have engineering properties, which is going to have predictive behavior. This became really important for us and for the rest of uh, chemistry now and other subjects as well, as I'll show you. And how it became that was by using this modular idea from engineering and by using this spacer. And if I may give you another example from uh, traditional Sri Lanka, like this and traditions in many other countries, this would be like an arranged marriage where uh, pay the parents of children would look in the newspaper on Saturday or Sunday and then they would say, oh yeah, here is someone who would be very suitable as a partner for my own child and then they will meet and they'll go through a certain procedure. Of course, the two children themselves haven't met each other. They may not even like each other. So they have to meet and they have to gradually get to know each other. 
in some cases they will say no no i'm not going to marry that guy for money or anything but in some cases as we know it works out very fine and they become lifelong partners who love each other so this is like that it's like a arranged marriage where certainly at the start you can only look at each other you definitely can't touch and that's what this is that's what the spacer is and so when you have these modular systems as i said they have much in terms of predictive behavior so the receptors usual properties of how, what target does it choose and how accurately does it choose it those are all preserved and similarly if you are using a fluorophore which is a fluorescent dye what color of light does it absorb the best what color of light does it put out the best in what efficiency and all of these things can be preserved except for one the one property that is changed is the intensity of light that comes out of the fluorophore it is changed because even though molecules have a lot of interactions with other molecules when they come very close together in chemistry there are a few relatively long range interactions long range enough to jump across the spacer so many of the normal chemistry behavior stops interactions wise but one interaction is still able to operate and that is this photo induced electron transfer photo induced electron transfer was only discovered in the 1970s and early 1980s they were discovered in germany in stuttgart the place where mercedes benz cars are built by a person called weller so we are all very grateful to him for bringing the idea into chemistry but now what we are going to do is take it further and we are going to take this idea into fluorescent switching and molecular logic and so what we were then able to realize was that this photo induced electron transfer is a rare long range interaction so that it can couple between this receptor here to the fluorophore here across this red box and why does it do that it's because these electron transfers are based on single electron transfers a single electron which used to be here is going to be pulled out of here taken across and pushed into here single objects have many weaknesses they don't have a family they don't have a partner but they have one big strength and the strength is autonomy they don't have to ask anybody else for what they want to do so when they want to do it they just do it and that is one of the few advantage of a single thing a single person or a single object and single electrons have that capability so you take the electron out of here and taking a electron out of a molecule or atom is something we learn about for gce ordinary level is what it was called when i was doing it at the age of 15 once upon a time and then we were taught about electrons being pulled out of atoms and molecules and uh, i was taught this by a lovely lovely high school teacher called errol fernando he's from morotu so very close to the university of morotu near saint sebastian's college and he taught this to us in my own school saint thomas's college in mount lavinia so this process of taking a electron out of a molecule is called oxidation you will remember and the energy you have to give to pull that electron out is called the oxidation potential so in this case we require the oxidation potential of the receptor in order to be able to pull this electron out it's like a farmer pulling out a a potato or a manioc or cassava from the ground you have to pull it out so you have to put some energy to pull it out and then we take the electron across and then push the electron in to the fluorophore so that's another as we said it's another molecule and that dye and so now you push the electron in and mr errol fernando taught me that is called the reduction and the energy you need to do that is called the reduction potential so we all learned these ideas like the electrochemical series which we learned in school uh, for 
O level and then GCE, advanced level for sure. And so Mr. Errol Fernando taught me this. So there's an energy you need here, the oxidation potential of the receptor, and you need an energy here, which is the reduction potential of the fluorophore. And now you add these two numbers. Don't take plus or minus signs. Just like an accountant, add the two numbers together. Or like a child learning arithmetic, just add the two numbers. This is the energy needed you must have if you want to do this electron transfer, like what happens in photosynthesis in the green leaf. Where do you get this energy from? Ah, it comes from the light that we are shining at the molecule the violet colored arrow. So the violet colored, uh, colored arrow brings light and that's energy and it's deposited like in a bank inside the fluorophore. And that is the excited energy of the fluorophore. So you know what that number is. You know how much energy you have. Ah, now you can be an accountant. You take that energy and you have to make sure that energy is a little bit more than the energy you need to do the oxidation here and the reduction here. That is all. And if you arrange that, so that is the design and the design part. And so then we can make sure that when the fluorophore is connected through the spacer to the receptor by using organic chemistry methods, then we can prepare a molecule which uses a fluorophore, which should be brightly fluorescent, but now the fluorescence is switched off. Why? The energy has been used to do something like photosynthesis the first step of photosynthesis, which is electron transfer. And please don't forget, photosynthesis is what, is what starts with electron transfer and finally gives starch like in rice for us to eat and oxygen for us to breathe. So this is vital, vital for life. So the PET process is religiously important for all of our existences. And here I am using it for something much smaller, but still important. So we have the off state now. And now I want to show you the on state where the same light is similar light is coming in. But now there is a light signal coming out. Why is the light signal coming out? Because the PET process has been stopped. See the big black cross here. The PET process has been stopped. And why is it stopped? It's because the receptor has now received the target. It's received M plus, so sodium plus, if you like. And here is where I remember my teacher, Errol Fernando, every time. I must have I've done hundreds of these kinds of talks in different parts of the world, which I'm very grateful for. And in almost each one, I will remember Errol, sir, because electrons, he taught me, and your teacher would have taught you, is negative in charge. The charge is negative in a physics sense. And the sodium ion or the metal ion in this case clearly has a plus charge on its face. So what happens now? The plus charge attracts the minus charge. So the metal ion tells the electron, you can't go. You have to stay with me. Or another way of saying it is the oxidation is much harder. The oxidation potential is a bigger energy because the sodium ion is holding the electron back. So the number here becomes much larger. The reduction potential here is essentially the same as before. Now, if you add the two numbers together, you get a much bigger number. And so we chose the excited energy to be a little bigger than the situation we had here. So now the fluorophore says, sorry, sorry, my energy is not enough to do these two jobs. And so it says, sorry, I can't help you. So the photo-induced electron transfer does not happen at all. So the molecule here, the fluorophore says, I have this energy. What do I do with it? After a while, it says, oh, no electron transfers today. So I have just got to release my energy as light, just like I received light in the first place. See, the argument is very straightforward. Of course, by the time the molecule sends out the light, the excited state energy degrades a little. So the color changes. So in this case, I showed you like violet light coming in and orange light comes out. But now the fluorescent signal is switched on. What we have here is a molecule giving a light signal when an atom is captured by it. Or another way of saying it is this. A small molecule, which we can't see easily, catches an even smaller atom, which we can't see as well. And what does it do? 
it sends a light signal to hit your face. Big you. You will be six feet tall maybe. And these atoms and molecules are nanometers in height and smaller. So we are like two meters. This guy is nanometers. And still you have a communication. This was a very important discovery for us at the time that molecules can communicate with people like a ghost and a person and the person gets scared when you think, good God, I saw this object. And so in the same way, what we have here is signaling from a molecule in its world to the human world, which is very different in size. So it's a philosophical point. We can communicate with molecules in this way. And now, of course, now this was in the 1985 and so on, but now it's very commonly practiced around the world now. And so then I wanted to show you a little piece of cinema, like many of you would have seen this um, not so long ago. And this is an older one. And so maybe worth your while to find this and see. I would recommend this because this James Bond is from Ireland. This James Bond is from England. So I particularly like this one. Uh, and in both of them, it's about dying and it's about time. Like this is tomorrow and this is just time. And I particularly like this. What I want to show you is that science and knowledge can come from all kinds of places. It doesn't have to only come from uh, a laboratory. It can come from very low class culture. This is James Bond. So even if James Bond is not high literature, it is easygoing literature. It's popular stuff. And it sometimes tells important philosophical stories. Like, for example, uh, let me take this poster, which is connected with Ireland. So I particularly want to show you this. Uh, in the James Bond stories, James Bond is not the hero. The hero or the heroine is James Bond's boss. It's some, in some films, it's a lady. And so in the newer ones, it's a gentleman. Uh, it's called, he's called M, a single letter M. And so M is the minister of defense and the cleverest person in the country. And he or she looks around for dangers and they spot dangers in the form of this bad man. And in this particular case, this man is so bad, you get to see him twice. And he's so bad, he's going to die like this. So that's the basic James Bond story. But it says something more. The James Bond story, the important point is this. M is in some films too old. In some films, he's too confused to go to where the bad man is. The bad man is usually on a lovely island. It could be Sri Lanka. And in some of the James Bond films, the bad guy's name is Silva, guy like me. So uh, in, the, like in this one, the island is of Japan. So it's usually an island far away. And so M cannot go there. There is a problem of access, traveling problem. So he gets hold of a younger guy. I talked of the value of youth earlier for you. And James Bond is younger. And so he's able to travel to faraway places. They might arrange transport like a nice car. And things that allow him to go to see the bad man and find out what the bad man is trying to do. And then to inform his boss. And then M will arrange aircraft to come over and bomb the guy and all kinds of things. But remember, people are going to die, at least on film. But the main message I want to tell you and myself is this. In the Bond films, the basic philosophy is one of access. You want to solve a problem, sometimes the problem is in a place where you cannot go to. And so then you have to get yourself an agent to do the job for you. So James Bond is the secret agent with license to kill. In the same way in science, people like you and I, we are the scientists. And sometimes we want to examine things which are in the inside of people, like a drop of blood, as I'll show you in a minute. And the drop of blood is too small for me to get into. So I have to find myself an agent, which is small enough, but still clever enough, to go inside that drop of blood or inside the body and then find out information about sodium for me. See, the James Bond story is philosophically the same as the stories that I'm trying to tell you. That's why I have this green line here in the green color of Ireland, which is molecules are miniature James Bonds. Like James Bond is a spy, he's gathering information and molecules can be small things which gather information in the same, same way. 
So this is how these molecules, which were designed under a tabili tree in Sri Lanka, work. I, I want to just show you, here are eight glasses or beakers. And in each one of these glasses, there is a James Bond molecule. Say here is 007 in both these beakers. And in these two, it's another James Bond, say 008. And in these two, 009. And here, uh, 010. As you know, 006 is dead, that kind of thing. But in this lower row, all the James Bond molecules are in the water and alone, nobody else. In the top row, they have met the bad guy. The target atom or molecule is present. And all these eight beakers have invisible ultraviolet light shining on them. So we can't see anything, it just looks black. But see the difference. Here the light signal is off. Here the light signal is on in the color of blue. Here it's on in the color of green. Here it's on in the color of red. This is see RGB. So like on your phone, RGB, so that it can the screen can light up in different ways and show pictures and run video. Uh, here is a case where it's like white or light blue and becoming black or colorless again. But notice this guy works opposite to the ones you see here. So again, in computer science, you will be used to this or in technology. In technology, when we meet logic gates, which are the gates which control information inside your phone or in your computer, you so many of you will know this very well, better than me, because I'm a poor chemist, uh, even though I like computer science and have enjoyed learning it for a long time now. But what we have here are the smallest logic gates in computer science, the yes logic gate, meaning target is not present here. So the target is like the target level is zero and the output is clearly zero, it's black. Here the target level is high, so its target level is one. And then you get a blue light signal, which is very strong. So the output is one, zero, zero input output, one, one, zero output here. So that's the yes logic bit. Similarly, this is the not logic bit, which is the opposite. When the target is low, the output is clearly high big white light signal. Here, when the target concentration is high, see, black as night. So it's the opposite. Zero in, one out. One in, zero out. So that's the not logic. So with these molecules, you can already see logic behavior. Most importantly, what I want to remind you is these are switching behavior, which is the switches are with which we make logic gates, as you know, in technology. So see, here is off. Here is on, big difference. Like green light is very strong here. Here the green light is essentially absent. Similarly, the red light is absent here. The blue light is absent here. So there you are. These are molecular switches, like a switch on the wall we used to put on a light in a house. And this idea, which started under the tabuli tree, is used around the world now by scientists in various places. Over 1,200 labs do this, labs. And I'm giving you names here. Like, for example, here is Salia de Silva, who I showed you a little while ago. So he has a lab in New Jersey in USA now. So I'm very proud of him and, and many others. And like, for example, here is a gentleman who helped me a lot over the years and still does. And he won a Nobel Prize in chemistry um, six years ago, six years ago now. So even big stars, Nobel Prize winning people use these ideas to solve their own problems. That is the value of a tool, a tool like a pen. I will use the pen to write on paper, you know, old fashioned. Thing. So then the pen is really useful because it's a great tool. And in the same way, this pet design is a great tool for scientists in many, many countries. I'm just showing you one map as an example. And they, it's being done in many, many countries in the world. So I hope you share the happiness and the pride that I feel for that family tree in Mount Lavinia, really. So now I want to show you an example. And I'm very grateful to Jim, Mark, Huarui, and Mark here for helping me to tell you this story. They work for this company. Roche, you can go to the pharmacy near your house, wherever in the world you live, and you can ask the pharmacist to show products which have this blue diamond. 
uh, Roche, she's one of the richest families in the world. They are privately owned. And they came to Belfast in the middle of a civil war because they wanted the fluorescent pet design. And I'm very grateful because they are such a big multinational. I won't be able to go through their front door. The dogs will get me because I'm an ordinary guy. But they came to see us because they wanted this principle that I showed you and which we all understand now. They wanted sensors sensitive to other things like we are sensitive to heat and light and so on. But they wanted sensors which will select sodium ions, not potassium, sodium. And later we made a separate one for potassium and so on. And they wanted off-on sensors, the yes logic gates I showed you before. And now I want to present to you a molecular structure with atoms. So as you can see here, oxygen, 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 nitrogen in a ring. And the ring has, as you know, in organic chemistry, we don't even show carbon. The bend in the line is a carbon atom. The bend in the line is a carbon atom and so on. And there's another oxygen underneath here. And this is a ring. It's a ring of atoms. And these pattern of rings means you can then put something inside the ring, like a ring on a finger after an arranged marriage. And so these are simple receptors, but it's a good receptor. It selects sodium very well made by actually a friend of mine in St. Louis in the USA. And so he had put this in a publication, in a scientific paper. So we cite, we quote him, we give him respect, and we take the procedure of how to make the molecule from. And then we were able to connect it through a spacer here to this other piece, which is a very common fluorophore. And you can recognize it as a fluorophore because it has double bond, single bond, double bond, single, double, single, double, single, double. If you have double, single, double alternating over a long distance, that is the property of pi electron conjugation. Conjugation means marriage, of course. And so if you have this double single, you can spot it in molecular structures. So this is a very long conjugation. And this, these molecules are very cheap. It's a commodity chemical made by BASF in Germany. They make this by ton quantities and it's very cheap. So we connected this piece from my friend in St. Louis and then this one from BASF and we connect it together and we connect it to a hydrophilic polymer, which is paper really. And then this became the molecule that Roche then developed. Of course, they are a big multinational, so they have influence all over the world. So they took this product all over the world. And here is something you can do now or you can do this later. Please put on your phone in your internet browser, OptiMedical. And then you will see the product. It's called Opti Products. And this company only has a few products. They are a spin-off from Roche. So this spin-off is not mine. I, I just worked with Roche. I was a consultant for them. But I saw how a multinational works at very close range. And I'm very grateful for what they taught me. And OptiMedical. So OptiMedical.com. And please also go to idex.com. They are a bigger company. So they have many more things on their website. But within the website, if you look for Vetstat, you will essentially see the same product. So they sell it in different ways. But here it is. And this is, as I show you now, used all over the world. Not because of us, because of Roche. Because Roche is such a giant. And so uh, th this is the product. Well, the, what we contributed, actually, you can't see but it's like the ghost who scares you like hell. You can't see it, but it's the important, most important part of the device. So here is a filter paper circle. It's a piece of paper. And this paper, it's uh, with a black dye, but it also contains the molecule I showed you on the previous page. Then a similar one is in the next one, but a new dye for potassium. The new, then here we use calcium, for example. And here we use one for proton, H+. And here, carbon dioxide, as you know, is an acidic molecule. We learn it in school, in ordinary level in Sri Lanka, I remember. And so these five black spots are done according to the Tamili tree in Sri Lanka. The orange spot is done according to another friend of ours from Regensburg in Germany. So that is different. But all the others are according to the Sri Lankan style, this pet design. And this plastic chip is really small. It's about four centimeters long one centimeter tall and about two or three millimeters thick. That's it. 
And as you see, it's got this little track, like a railway line. And then along the railway line, there will be the station. So there will be Mora Mora Tua, Korla Vella, you get Ratmalana, Mount, Mount Lavinia and so on. And so these stations are where the blood stops and the blood goes along it. And then we, the blood is filtered to remove the red blood cells. And then the serum of the blood is nearly colorless. And then we shine a blue LED, like a Christmas tree light. And you shine it. And then it gives out green light for the fluorescent molecule that is there, the BASF molecule that is there. And the intensity of the light will tell you how much sodium concentration there is. You can count the sodium in blood, whole blood, no treatment. You just take the blood and put it inside here. That's it. And I'm particularly happy to tell you that this was used in Sri Lanka during the war time that you would remember in like 2000 to about 2009 or so when the war thankfully stopped. And during those periods of time, during suicide bombings and things, these were used by the ambulance paramedics in Sri Lanka. So I hope you share that sense of happiness. I feel that many lives were saved. Of course, the lives are saved by doctors and nurses, but they need equipment to help to save lives. And many lives which were lost at that time because people did not understand salt shock, it's called. And now they can measure the sodium which is in the salt. And now all those lives are saved. And many of those, a good number of those lives are Sri Lankan. And of course, in other parts of the world. And, and because this is so important, it's used in critical care in the USA where it started, but it's used for many other purposes. And as you can see now, because you are interested in entrepreneurship, as Nadika mentioned earlier. And so for that, you can see it has made serious amounts of money, like total amount of money here. So now this is wrong. The money is much higher than this uh, because Roche don't need me anymore. They got the ideas now and they use it. So this is the last time their accountancy guys talked to me. So then it was 550 million US dollars. Huh? So this is serious money. So now it's much more than that. So I, I would guess now it's closer to 1,000 million, which is 1 billion US dollars for this little plastic chip alone. Of course, the plastic chip is the only place where we made our contribution. This box is separate money, but that is not done by us. So this has been seriously enterprising for us, for sure. But I'm very grateful to them for recognizing that we had a solution which they could use. So I'll always be grateful to them. And I, and I hope you also share this happiness of how a multinational company can join with small people like us who started out under that family tree. Huh? So now uh, I'm coming close to the end of the time. I'll just show you a couple of other examples, an example of logic, of course, before we finish. So these are simplest logic gates, like yes logic gates. And here is another one from that Daya Rupa Singh in that paper I showed you on the very first or the second slide. That also is sold now but it makes much less money. But again, you can Google for lysosensor, lysosensor blue or lysosensor green. And the green one was done by Nimal Gunaratna, who's from Sri Lanka, of course, and he's in Belfast now. He's nearly my neighbor here. So, uh, so these are sold by this company, Thermo Fisher, which is quite big, really. Uh, and these are used in very interesting places. Like, for example, in Sri Lanka, the big ca cancer center is in Maharagama. Uh, one of the largest cancer centers in America and in the world is in New York and it's called the Sloan Kettering Center. And there, the scientists who do research into cancer used lysosensor blue many years ago now, 20, nearly 20 years ago, to understand radiation therapy, which is even given in Maharaga, where you can see uh, this blue light formed here. And that says there are protons close by. The lysosensor blue detects protons, H plus or acid. And it's detecting acid in some cells from a mouse in this case. But now I want to tell you, as Ruchira told you, that molecular logic is perhaps our most, uh, one of our most useful scientific discoveries. But as I showed you now, the Roche application is perhaps the most used human discovery that we were able to make from the simplest of logic gates or sensors, as they tend to be usually called. But we were very fortunate about 30 years ago, next year is the 30th anniversary, so it will be an important celebration for us, where we were able to discover this idea of molecular logic, which is now a field within science. It's not a bigger field as chemistry or bigger field as physics, but it's still a field. And it draws people from different subjects, as I'll show you in a minute. 
But the really clever person here is this guy. He is George Bull. He worked in the south of Ireland. Cork is a fairly small town in the south of Ireland. And Belfast, where I work, is in the north of Ireland. And I think it was like fate making the connection for us. Uh, George Bull worked at the time of the Great Famine in Ireland, where mil- maybe a million people died. Uh, and that's why the Irish population is still so low. The country is bigger than Sri Lanka and still the population is about 5 million. Sri Lanka is 22 million, isn't it? And so, and so that's, that was a really hard time in Ireland. And that's the time he made this discovery that languages can be constructed from the number zero and the number one. That was the Boolean discovery, which led to Boolean logic and which led to logic gates by his students and which became your phone. So this guy is the real genius because his idea is in your pocket. That's how big it is. Ours is a much smaller contribution, but we were inspired by him. And I was specially inspired to do this work in molecular logic by a dear, dear friend of mine called Satish Namasivayam, who worked for a long time. And I think still he's connected with the Arthur C. Clarke at the University of Murphy. He was in the University of Colombo studying physics and I'm very grateful to him. I mention him very, very often in public fora of many kinds. And so he's a physics guy. And so he taught me the first molecule, not mo- the logic gates from physics. And he gave me the first logic gates to touch and feel and to assemble. So I'm very grateful to Satish. Uh, and so he's a huge contribution to uh, Sri Lankan science and technology. So the Arthur C. Clarke Center was lucky to have him, in my opinion. And so that's how we were able to then do molecular logic. And then we were able to show that it's a great way of understanding chemistry through computer science. And you can organize many parts of chemistry. And Nima Gunaratna, who I mentioned earlier, and Colin McCoy, we worked together to introduce this subject. And uh, Nima still works in in Queen's University of Belfast. And Colin also works at the Queen's University of Belfast. He's the head of department of our school of pharmacy here. So I'm delighted that he's gone on to very big things now. And I'm delighted that he worked with me and Nima. And and molecular logic has done various, various things now. The first molecules which could count 0, 1, and add 1 and 1 and to get 2 were made in Queen's University of Belfast 20 years ago, 22 years ago. And many other things are done now by many people around the world. But I want to finish by showing you one example of human level computation, where molecules will do a computation that you are doing. And I collected a lot of these into a book. You can look at, look at it on the web. And, but what I really wanted to show out of this book, which is about 10 years old now, is that in the very following year, it was translated into Chinese and by good friends of mine. And it was translated into Japanese again by a dear friend of mine into Japanese. They wanted Chinese youngsters and Japanese youngsters. These are two very technology driven countries, as you know. They wanted their young people to learn these new ideas in the mother language. But then you understand philosophical concepts the best. So I'm very, very happy to show you this. And now, just in passing, I want to just show you something. Here is a bit from, don't worry about these blue boxes. Here is this, just concentrate on the orange box, if you will. And here is the heart of your phone. Like if you have dropped a phone and you've seen the chip inside, the big chip inside, the CPU inside, and if you break it as well, if you drop your phone really hard, then it's almost invisible. Tiny, tiny, there are nanometric sizes now. And then this is the logic device. And what does the logic device do? It receives voltage signals in and it gives a voltage signal out. And that is the logic device. Here is another orange colored box, which I'm showing you from a chemistry lab. Or don't go to a chemistry lab. Just go to your kitchen. You take a saucepan and into the saucepan, I put some rice, dry rice. And then into that, I put some water, which is a reagent like in a chemistry lab. I would pour it from a bottle. And here I get some water from the well and I put it in with my rice. And then I apply a condition. I don't need a Bunsen burner. I light a fire like my grand- grandmother would have done to feed me. And then... Uh, we boil the rice for some time. And what happens? Then the rice changes its look, it changes its smell, and it, of course, changes its texture if you eat it and see. So that is the readout. See, inputs come into the rice 
and you get an output and we finally eat it just the same way as here when we first recognize this similarity the philosophical similarity between electronics and logic gate behavior and computer science and general cooking in the house or chemistry anywhere or this chemistry is what is happening inside of you at this very moment in time this was maybe our biggest discovery not molecular logic it was to realize that the science the vidya that is in your phone and the vidya that is inside your rice being cooked or the cells inside your body are the same that was the big discovery so this was picked up by many many people there's over 1500 labs in the world which do this about half of them are chemists but now a very large number of them are molecular biologists there are even some computer scientists so I'm delighted to show you this these people have realized the value of molecules doing computation for this reason again i want to share with you an idea which is not generally believed i must say if you ask about information technology from people they will immediately think of a phone they will immediately think of computer programming they will they will think of a desktop computer or a laptop no 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 the biggest information technology is you you because you are alive because the individual parts of you are taking information from outside and acting on behalf due to that information on behalf of all the cells in your body and it keeps you alive every day and keeps you as beautiful as somebody else will say that you are that is the truly powerful information technology every one of your cells inside of you which is a organization of molecules is receiving inputs putting out outputs and keeping you alive when those outputs fail sometimes we get cancer and sometimes we die sometimes we fall ill and all these things happen that is the information technology what is the meaning of technology technology is the application of information technology is the application of science so the application of scientific information is what we are doing all the time every time you walk on the road and you see a bus and you avoid the bus and avoid getting killed that is information technology in living action that is the biggest message i want to give you it really is us all living things are the greatest information technology that there is computer science existed when after the invention okay the transistor on a large scale but it existed before also in other forms and back to george bull you could say and that's 150 years living things have been here for millions of years successfully so there you are something for you to discuss with your friends and to think about and now just to finish thank you very much for your patience i hope i haven't used too much of your time i'll just do this very quickly here is molecules performing something called edge detection edge detection is available in vision of animals of all kinds including us any time you see anything like you're seeing anything now if you're seeing this slide now you are doing this it's subconscious you can't stop it it always happens it, we all do it when we are awake it is checking what is in front of you whether it's a threat a danger or not so military people have to do this much more but oh everybody does this and we are built in that way and then later computer science learned from it and they built machine vision for security and for factory usage and you use it in zoom to change your background right nadika had a special background or and uh, all of them had a special background actually and those are edge detection routines and like i'm older guy and so it's in photoshop and things like that and and jue and gawa and jessica and tom helped me seven years ago to build molecular edge detection systems in a synthetic way for the first time and so he is the example i keep this very short and stop we take a object and the object here is a square hole cut in a, a black plastic and then we have a filter paper circle and this filter paper circle carries this molecule here it's a yes logic gate molecule that is all when protons coming then it will give a light signal in the orange color like you see here and then we add a photo acid generator to the paper photo acid generators are molecules which use light to create protons by using another chemical 
that is present there. In fact, that is how they cut the chips for your phone or for your laptop and these photo acid generators. So we have that and the paper is prepared very carefully, we dry it like this. And we shine this ultraviolet light, which is available in many chemistry labs around the world, including Sri Lanka. I used one when I was there in 1980s, it is 254 nanometer. And so we cover the filter paper with this mask and you shine the light for different amounts of time. And if you shine it for eight minutes, then you start to see this orange square. That is the protons jumping on top of this molecule here and giving orange light, like we all understand together. But see what happens when you shine light for longer, like 32 minutes. Now the center of the square is blue again, and you're left with an orange border, like a border on a nice sari, but a thin border. And this thin border is the detected edge. This is edge detection. Edge detection is what we do to check on the outlines of objects, like your brain like my brain, you still have the outline of an elephant compared to the outline of a man or woman. And the outlines are different. And the brain can figure that out in a millisecond of time. And so when you see an elephant, a child has to be careful. And all Sri Lankans know that. And that's because from childhood, our brains were told, elephant, be careful. We have big ears and a big nose. So that's how we found out. So here is a synthetic organic molecule doing the same thing as well. But as you can see, you can do this in a millisecond, one thousandth of a second. And we require 60 times 30 minutes to do it. So our application is a very slow one here. So this we cannot sell yet. But thank you very much for listening to me. And I apologize for going a little over time. Thank you very much for your patience. And I wish you all success for your conference. And thank you again for allowing me to be a part of it for today. Thank you very much. Sir, your years of research, your depth of understanding, and your ability to present very enthusiastically and passionately did the impossible. You made chemistry seem interesting and even understandable. The Thank parallels you. that you drive from James Bond to arranged marriages, it truly spoke to our hearts. Standing on the shoulders of giants, so throughout your presentation, it was a testament to this saying. You spoke of the scientists who came before you, whose work made your work possible. And you talked about the importance of collaboration across industries so that our research can help serve humankind. And as people who have lived through the civil war in Sri Lanka, we are very grateful for your service. Thank you. So thank you very much once again for accepting the invitation and for making a very memorable contribution to our conference. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. It was my great pleasure. Thank you. Next, ladies and gentlemen, we have a very special event lined up for you. As a gesture of adding color to this inauguration ceremony, Mrs. Lakmi Kumarasiri has prepared a very special dance performance called Nari Lata. And before you get swept away in the graceful movements of this dance ensemble, let me take a few moments to introduce to you the gifted and talented Mrs. Lakni Kumarasiri. Mrs. Lakni is the lecturer in charge of aesthetic studies right here at ITUM. She's a graduate from the Sri Pali campus of University of Colombo, and she has obtained her Master of Philosophy from the Postgraduate Institute of Archaeology at University of Kalanir. She is a Visharada in Bharata Natya and a Sri Lankan traditional dancer in low country, up country and Sabaragamur. She has authored a book on the Vedda dance culture and she is the first and only researcher to have studied in depth about the dance practices of our indigenous people. She has won many accolades including Best Dancer and Best Stage Drama Costume Designer. In 2017, she was selected to represent Sri Lanka as a performance artist at the Performance Art Intensive Residency in Leeds, UK. 
and this year she was chosen to follow the dance movement psychotherapy foundation course at university of roehampton in uk so with that ladies and gentlemen i invite you to immerse yourself in the graceful movements of the dance performance brought to you by mrs lakshmi kumarasiri and mr tilina dayanand nari lata is a flower said to be in a shape of a woman and considered to be one of the most wonderful and rarest of flowers in the world
I hope you enjoyed that captivating performance as much as we did. I am very proud to announce that the entire dance performance from the choreography to the costume design, direction, production was a complete product of ITUM. So with that moving performance, ladies and gentlemen, we near the end of the inauguration ceremony. To deliver the vote of thanks, I cordially invite Mrs. Lakshika Amarasinghe. Thank you, Ms. Kayanti. Good morning, everyone. The director of ITUM, the keynote speaker, heads of divisions, and the academic staff of ITUM, the administrative staff, invited guests, and all other participants. It is my pleasant duty today to propose the word of thanks at the first international research conference of ITUM, fostering research to collaboration and innovation. On behalf of the research unit of ITUM, I wish to express my sincere gratitude to you all for your presence at this online academic forum. First and foremost, I would like to express my sincere thanks to Major General, retired SK Tirunao Karasu, RSP, VSV, USP, the director of ITUM for his constant guidance, cooperation and support to the last moments of the research conference. I thank you, sir, for your encouragement throughout the whole process of organizing this academic event. Secondly, I would like to express my sincere gratitude to the keynote speaker, Professor A.P. De Silva from the School of Chemistry and Chemical Engineering, Queen's University, Belfast, United Kingdom, for accepting our invitation and adding value to the research conference with his presence and sharing his valuable ideas with us. Thank you very much, sir. I also express my sincere appreciation to the editorial board headed by Mrs. Sunmali Nagodavitana, senior lecturer attached to the Division of Interdisciplinary Studies and the review panel of the research conference for the untiring efforts in language editing, reviewing the research papers and checking and formatting the proceedings book. I also acknowledge the valuable support given by Dr. Mrs. Manoja Samaradivakara, the assistant librarian of the University of Moratua, I'm sorry, the University of Sri Javadanapura in taking plagiarism. My thanks also go out to the chairpersons of the technical sessions and the research paper presenters for their keen interest in presenting their research findings at this academic forum. I also thank all the pre-conference speakers, moderators, and the computing team of the pre-conference of their cooperation. Also, I wish to thank the Division of Information Technology of ITUM for their tremendous work and the cooperation in formatting the proceedings book, providing technological assistance and the physical settings to conduct this research conference virtually. Let me also thank Ms. Lakshmi Kumar Siri, the aesthetic lecturer of ITUM and her team from the Division of Interdisciplinary Studies for adding charm to the, this academic event for their performance. I must also express my deep sense of appreciation to Dr. Mrs. Srimala Pereira, the head of the research unit of ITUM, for her inspiring leadership in organizing this research conference, and the chairperson of the research conference, Dr. Ms. Nadika Tisera, and the research committee for their tremendous effort to host this event. Let me also express my gratitude to all heads of the divisions and the academic staff of ITUM, the members of the administrative staff, the members of the non-academic staff, and all others who contributed in many ways to make this event a reality. Finally, I wish to express my sincere thanks to all the participants at this webinar for being with us today. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. I cordially invite you to join the technical sessions. Thank you. As the next step our research conference, I wish to introduce the chairpersons of the technical sessions. Session one will be chaired by Dr. Mrs. Kaushika Premaratna, lecturer from the Division of Interdisciplinary Studies, ITUM. Session two will be chaired by Dr. Pramila Semananda, senior lecturer from the Division of Civil Engineering Technology, ITUM. 
session 3 will be chaired by dr sudarshan perera lecturer from the division of polymer and chemical engineering technology itu thank you Dear presenters, you all can join the technical session. So, with this note, uh, we are going to close the inauguration session. Thank you. Recording stop.